so JavaScript, I expect you to be able to pick up that, uh, that syntax and all that functionality. I want to focus on just a few uh, kind of unique things that we're going to use JavaScript for and leave the rest up to you to figure out uh, variables, loops, functions, et cetera. Uh, data structures, I won't show any data structures if you want to use arrays and objects and things like that. Uh, that'll be up to you studying. It's not hard it, at this level of your career. That should be very simple to pick up. It might take some time, might take some hours, but uh, going through that tutorial, you should be able to figure, uh, read the documentation and figure that out. So what we have right now are, is HTML and CSS, and we can define the structure of a page and we can style that structure. But this is a very boring site, it's a very static site. Uh, it's what I like to refer to as poster sites. If you want to make a pretty poster and you just have a website where you need to get information out to people. Maybe you have a local restaurant, you don't have anything like ordering online or things like that. You just want to post your menu, the name of your restaurant, your hours, things like that. HTML and CSS is going to be enough for you. You don't need any JavaScript. You don't need a, uh, necessarily a server with functionality, as we'll talk about the rest of the semester. Uh, you just need HTML and CSS. That's all we can do right now. It's not necessarily interesting. So let's add JavaScript to the mix to start building more dynamic websites. So HTML and CSS are not programming languages, technically. So somebody posted that uh, a link in Twitch. Yeah, I saw you. I see it. Uh, so I did some reading yesterday. I thought it was, uh, these were not programming languages. HTML is not. But the combination of CSS and HTML, as it turns out, can form a Turing complete, uh, does form a Turing complete language. If you use HTML5 and CSS3, which are the modern standards, uh, the current standards, there is, there are things you can do to actually uh, have control flow loops uh, and things like that. Uh, if you combine them, I, I believe from what I was reading, CSS alone is not a programming language, but once you combine it to, with HTML and give it something to work with, technically, yes, you can. You can do anything with these. You can program with these languages. Uh, but it's not common. It's more of a, a niche thing. Uh, there are, I, I was, when I was reading up on that, uh, there are people with projects like building full functionality sites with HTML and CSS, crazy stuff they're doing. Uh, but it's not standard. It's not what you would normally do. But technically, you can. So I had to throw that out there. It's interesting stuff. It's interesting reading about that. Uh, JavaScript, on the other hand, no doubts about it, it's a programming language. It's a full programming language, you can declare variables, you can have loops, control flow, write functions. You can do anything you would expect to be able to do, with a few notable exceptions we'll see on the next slide, in JavaScript. So, there are a lot of implications of JavaScript being a programming language. What you are doing when you visit a website is you're downloading the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript of a site, code that other developers have written, the browser is rendering the HTML on the page, applying the CSS to that, and then running their JavaScript on your machines. So you are running code, arbitrary code that you've never seen before, written by somebody else, downloading it on your machine and running it. So there are a lot of implications of this. There are a lot of security concerns. If somebody can run arbitrary code on your computer, I mean, they can just break all your stuff, steal all your information. There's a lot they can do with that. It's one of the main attacks that attackers are trying to do, this arbitrary program execution. They can run code on your machine. They can start installing viruses, stealing information. They can do whatever they want um, at that point. So there are some issues here that need to be addressed, and thankfully they have been addressed, obviously because uh, we're not all sitting here with broken laptops, is JavaScript has some notable things that it cannot do. So JavaScript cannot read and write files. You cannot create files in JavaScript. You can't read files in JavaScript. Uh, and uh, before we get too far, before somebody says, hey, I've written files in JavaScript before. Uh, I'm not talking about Node.js. If you use Node.js, yes, you can do all these things. You can write files. That is full functionality. You have everything available to you. But when JavaScript is ran in a browser, the browser will not allow JavaScript to write files, read files. That functionality does not exist when JavaScript is executing in a browser. So you can't read and write files. So if you have another file in your website, you can't write JavaScript code that says, 
go download that file from my server, and then read that file, parse its contents, and do something based on it. That's something you just can't do, and we'll see uh, what we do instead later in the semester when we get there. But you cannot read and write files in the browser with JavaScript, just something you can't do. You can't access other windows and tabs. You're isolated to that page that you're viewing. You can send HTTP requests to other sites, and there are security implications there that we'll talk about later in the semester. But you can't just say, hey, give me a list of all the open tabs, and hey, let me go navigate over to this other browser window and see what's going on over there and modify the HTML over there. Can't do things like that. And can't read the cookies or local storage from other sites. So when a site uses cookies, we use cookies for, and sometimes local storage, for authentication. You type in your username and password, you get a token, an authentication token, then you don't have to type in your username and password again until that token expires or delete, that you delete it or you switch browsers or, or whatever. Get a new laptop that when it doesn't have access to that cookie anymore, you gotta log in again. But you don't have to log in every time because of that token. Well, if somebody clicks on your attack website, you can't just steal those tokens for other websites. You can't just say, hey, I have all your access tokens for all your sites and I'm gonna go uh, masquerade as you out there on the internet. Can't do it. So big security implications if that you could do this, which is exactly why you can't. So, and there's always more vulnerabilities. There, it's a huge cat and mouse game. The attackers find a new vulnerability, and then the, the browser developers patch it out. Uh, it, it's a constant, uh, as with most security topics, it's always that, uh, that cat and mouse game. The attackers take a step ahead, and uh, the security teams take another step ahead. So with that, what are we going to do with JavaScript, or what can we do with JavaScript? So we can, the big thing that I'll focus on today is we can manipulate what's called the DOM, the document object model, which is a tree structure storing all of your HTML elements. So at the top level you have that HTML element, then you have head and body in there, and then all your elements for your, your, uh, your site. Uh, this is what we call the DOM document object model. That's what's storing all of those HTML elements. So we can manipulate DOM through JavaScript and through some special functions, um, technically methods, I guess, through functionality, I'll say, in JavaScript to be able to manipulate that. So with this one, this example here, we're going to take the DOM and ask it to get us an element by a particular ID. And this is Excuse me. One big reason why the IDs of elements have to be unique. So when we say, hey document, get me the element with this ID, it's only going to return one specific element. It's going to give us the element, the unique element with that ID. So if I have some element on my HTML named my div, I'm gonna say, hey Dom, give me that element. And now I have a reference to that element in a variable that I can work with as with you know, any programming language. This is an object, it has, uh, has methods, it has uh, member variables it, or fields, whatever you wanna call them. And we can mess around with those variables to manipulate how this page looks. So one variable is inner HTML. This is all the HTML in that element. So between the open tag and the closed tag, everything in between is that inner HTML. So I wanna grab that inner HTML and just change it here. I'm just gonna add some content to my page through JavaScript. I'm gonna save this in a file. I'm just gonna call it script.js. I should say .js. Uh, I'll save it in script.js and then import this into my HTML to get this to run on my page. So if I have this HTML that we saw from uh, the last lecture, I have some div with an ID my div. Uh, and that's the element I, wanna, I want to manipulate through my JavaScript. So with this code saved in a file named script.js, I have to tell my HTML to run that JavaScript somehow. When a server gets the HTML, when you open the HTML in your browser, only that HTML can be seen by the browser, so that HTML has to point to all the other files that are needed. So here we're gonna point to script.js using the script tags. Script, I have some JavaScript, and you can just type JavaScript in the website itself. It's discouraged, it's not good practice. Uh, 
it's better to have an external file and then um, link to the external file. If you look through the source code of some pages, a lot of them will have inline JavaScript in the HTML. I, I believe a lot of those are just using reducers and minifiers. They, they have them in separate files, but then they jam them all in one file to make, uh, to optimize some things, I believe, or they just had, in my opinion, bad practices if they're not doing that. Anyway, uh, SRC for source, go to this file and run that file on this page. So whenever you run a script tag, whenever the browser gets to a script tag and loads that element, that JavaScript is going to run immediately when that element loads. And this is why we put our script tag at the bottom of the body. All of this must have been loaded by the time we get to the script tag. If I run this JavaScript, oops, if I, we run this JavaScript before my div exists in the document, well, it's not gonna do anything. So we gotta make sure this element loads before we run our JavaScript that's going to manipulate that element. Yes? Yes. So, so this will, every browser is going to have this document object and it will have, there's certain methods that every browser will implement and you have access to that. So when the browser runs this, it's going to already have the document object loaded as it renders the HTML and you'll have the methods that we'll see, you'll have them all available to you. Yes? Is the difference then, because you said you should put that script tag at the bottom of the body. What would be the difference in if you put that in the head tag? Because like I know I've mm -hmm. seen that a lot. So you, so there are a few different places you can put the script tag. Yeah, you can put it in the head as well. If you're running a script, uh, if you're running a script like this and you put it in the head, I'm not gonna have a perfect answer for you, but uh, uh, just to give me a heads up on that. But if you put it in the head, you could be running the risk that it'll run before uh, that div is loaded. You might get lucky and it might work anyway, but if you put that in the head, when you have a script like this that's going to run immediately is the, the big difference here. This script I want to run as soon as it's loaded, uh, then I could be running that risk. A lot of times we'll put scripts in the head where we're importing libraries and we just want a collection of functions and objects that we'll then call later. So it doesn't really matter as much when those are loaded because we're not running code, we're not executing code immediately when that library is downloaded. So if we have, if this is just a function and I put it in the head and then called that function later on in my code, then I'd be fine. Uh, another option uh, that I'd like to do, I would rather wrap this in a function and then do body on load, call that function. So I make sure I guarantee that everything loaded at that point is a, a, my favorite way to do it. But, um, we can see that. Maybe I'll do that when we get to the live code. <clears throat> and the page looks like this. Right, any other questions on that example? So question, some elements have ID, name, and uh, tag, right, the other one? Yeah, some kind of, uh, label, that is the, uh, so label I'm not too familiar with. I, I know I've used it before, but I can't tell you exactly what the difference is. Uh, name, though, is similar to ID, but it does not have to be unique. So if you get something by, by its name, you might be getting multiple elements, so you'll end up getting an array of elements and you'd have to iterate through the, that array and get exactly what you want out of that. Uh, the ID is the only one that has to be unique. So if you want one specific element with one specific purpose, you would use ID. Uh, and name is also used typically for a form. You want to name a form uh, entry. That name is going to be attached to whatever is entered in that form when you send it to the server. So the server is going to use that name to be able to tell what data it's looking at at that point. Uh, and uh, 
name not being unique, for example, if you have radio buttons where you only want one of them selected, they would all have the same name but different values. So when the server gets it, they'll get a value attached to that name. Even though you have multiple elements with the same name, the server is only going to get one value attached to that name with a form. Any other questions? Okay, let's talk about JavaScript events. This is where things get, uh, uh, get a little more interesting. Just running code when the page loads or, or when the JavaScript loads isn't super uh, interesting. It's just running JavaScript once. Well, if you're just running JavaScript once, like in the previous example, why wouldn't I just put that content in my HTML? There's no, there's no real, well, real big reason to do that. What we really want out of our JavaScript is reacting to events and have an event-based architecture to the front ends of our websites. Now, whenever an event is triggered, we can run a JavaScript function on that event. And this is, this is mostly how we use it. So, for example, I have some div here with some, uh, oh, I didn't put any text in it. It's my div, so I'm adding text to the other JavaScript in this example. Uh, but with the ID my div, and I'm giving it something that it's going to do on certain events. So when these events are triggered, I'm running JavaScript functions, calling a function, I should have semicolons here technically, uh, I'm running these functions when those events trigger. So for this example, I have two JavaScript functions that are going to change one of the properties, we're changing the style, changing the color, going into that CSS of the element and making a change to that CSS in JavaScript but I'm doing that on an event. So when the mouse enters this div, I'm gonna call make blue, passing this element as a reference. So I'm working with this element. And then when the mouse exits that div, I wanna call some more JavaScript and change the element to a different color. So I can react to these events and have some code that's ran whenever those events occur. It's such a big concept that I, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it more when we go to the live coding, but I feel like I, I should have more to say about this other than that. It's a whole time to talk about the concept itself. Um, any questions about this one? Yes. You said there was supposed to be semicolons after some of the other calls? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, so, yeah, and right here. So when I wrote this example, apparently I wasn't thinking about semicolons. Uh, but there should be semicolons. You'll get away with it. The browser will just... Uh, just like the HTML and CSS, the browser will kind of figure it out. But it's not, it's fairly hard, I shouldn't say it, but it, it's, it, uh, it's easier to get broken JavaScript to run than in most other languages. You can certainly still do it if you have like null uh, references and stuff. Um, but the browser will try to run your JavaScript code. So if you have those semicolons missing, it's usually not gonna bite you. But uh, with the language spec, you technically should have them in there uh, after each statement. And by the way, I, I have a few more slides, but most of today, at least half of today, is going to be live coding. I want to go and just build sites and, and show you how this stuff works um, in the code because in the slides, I don't know. Uh, I don't like slides for this content too much, but I want to go through these ones. And then the last thing I want to talk about is browser extensions. So browser extensions is effectively when you want to add some JavaScript to a site that is not yours. You would install an extension into your browser or write extensions like we'll do today. And then whenever you visit a page, your JavaScript is going to run on that page. So if you want to kind of manipulate pages a bit, we're going to see this to be able to do that. We're going to see how that works. And I'll explain that quite a bit more, lead up to it more when we go to the live coding, which I believe is right now. Oh, that slide was not supposed to be there. Sorry if you saw that one, if you downloaded them. Uh, the activity that's replaced with the homework, of course. Um, the homework instead of the activity. Last time I did this, I had activities like that. Not this time. All right, let's see some code. So those are the concepts. 
JavaScript is going to add a programming language to our website. It has some certain restrictions, so we can't do everything. We can't do file I.O. We can't look at other websites running on the machine. Uh, we're really confined to this, our page itself. Uh, and we can react to events that occur on our page. And we can write extensions to run JavaScript on other people's pages. So first, let's start with a site. Let's build a quick site. I just had the outline here, so, uh, so we're not uh, building this from a complete scratch. But I want I have a skeleton of a page, and I want this to be a upvote, downvote page. That's what I want to build right now. I want an upvote button, and a downvote button, and the vote count. Now, we don't have any servers, so we, we can't have a full voting uh, feature site. We'll definitely do that later in the semester. But let's just uh, build a page for one user to be able to upvote and downvote as many times as they want, so they can keep mashing the button. Yes? Uh, what do, oh, the language right here? No, this, this is telling the browser what language you already wrote the page in. So it's saying this, this is English. So if it wants, uh, the browser wants to run, geez, I don't even know. I, I was going to say spell checker, but I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but the browser is looking at that, and then the browser does some, something based on that language tag. I'm not particularly sure what it's doing, but it's just notifying, hey, this is in English. This page is written in English. Mm, yeah, good call. So if uh, Google Spider is out there crawling the web and sees that English tag, it knows, okay, I'm going to run my English processor on this page. If it sees uh, a Dutch tag, it's going to uh, uh, run the, the German. Did I get my languages right? It's going to run uh, different languages based on that. Excellent point. So let's get our buttons out here. Button, just another HTML element. Button, I'm just going to say upvote. Downvote, little line break in between them. Beautiful page, and there's nothing in the JavaScript yet. That's what we want to focus on. Let's get the structure of the page first. I'll open this in Finder. Double click it, and just open the file. Zoom in, and just open the file in our, uh, in our browser. So it's a very beautiful site. We have an upvote and downvote button. Upvote and downvote spelled out. You would love to see a site like that, right? Uh, and we want one last thing. I'm going to add a div here with an ID of votes, which is going to track the number of votes that have been placed. So if I click upvote, I want that number to increment. If I click downvote, I want that number to decrement. So this is, what, this is our goal, this is what we want to accomplish. Here's the structure, the HTML is mostly done at this point. Uh, but we have to add some JavaScript to this site to make it do what we want it to do. So we have, excuse me, we have our script tag. We're going to get this voting.js file running on our page, but voting.js does nothing right now. So let's add some functionality to this site. So the first thing that I want to do is store the total number of votes in a variable. This is a full programming language. We have all the programming language stuff that we want. That includes variables. So I'm going to create a variable named votes. Initialize at zero. This is just the number of votes that have been placed. Uh, let's do upvote next. It's function. I want to define a function that's going to be called on the upvote button. I'm going to name it upvote votes plus plus. We're not getting too crazy with the programming, obviously. Uh, I just have some function that's going to increment votes. I have nothing to say about that one. Uh, but we have to link to this button. We can do 
on click, so I want to say when the event of click occurs, which of course is when the user clicks on this button, when this button is clicked, I want some JavaScript to happen. I want that to be upvote. I want to call to the upvote function. While we're here, let's do downvote. And I'll have my semicolons this time. And I want to get my downvote function here, too. So now these functions are going to be executed when those buttons are clicked. Yes? Vote minus minus. Thank you. Uh, so we have our function. They're called when uh, they're called when our buttons are pressed, and we're going to update this variable to be able to display. Uh, sorry, to, to track the votes. But we still haven't displayed anything for this. So we have our div with ID votes which is just always going to display zero to the user. So when I go to my page, I reload this, I can click these buttons all I want. It's always going to display zero, even though the variable votes is changing, just not being displayed to the user, which makes it basically worthless. So I want some other function that I'm going to call, call it update display which is going to get that element I'm going to change the inner.html I believe inner.html is pretty agreed upon that it's bad practice I just want to do that to show what we're, uh, what's going on here uh, just how to manipulate the DOM you do more sophisticated things in real production sites just to throw that out there um, inner, inner HTML isn't, uh, isn't the best thing you would really be doing. It's probably not the worst thing either, but I believe it's regarded as bad practice. Right? No. Maybe not. I shouldn't have even said this. I shouldn't have dug myself in this hole. It's document.write. Don't use that one. <laughs> that one's just a, a big no. Uh, maybe inner, yeah, never mind. I'll look, at the, I'll look that up later. Uh, so I just want to set this equal to votes. <laughs> I shouldn't think out loud in the middle of a lecture. Anyway, I'm going to set that equal to votes, and now whenever update display is called, it's going to update that div. And I want to call that each time my votes change. In this case, yeah. It'll convert that to a string. Uh, if, if I wanted to make this explicit, we do have two strings. Uh, but it will do that automatically. Oops, 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 oops. Okay. And now we should have our full site. Yay. Now, let's get you to the point where you can do everything with the homework. That's uh, objective three in the homework, effectively there. Uh, so we have this site. We have some JavaScript added to it. We're reacting to user events. There are tons of different events that you can react to, by the way. There's a lot you can do. Um, a, a lot of things, just about everything that happens in the browser, it seems, has an event attached to it that you can link into uh, and do something based on that event. All right, so now let's... Let me just briefly check my outline. Yep. Just to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. So we have this site, and I want to talk about our first, maybe second, depends on the, those brief mentions, how you consider those, but our first real like security question here. What can somebody do to break our sites is a question we're going to ask all semester long, and we're going to start that right now. So to break this site, Anybody who knows how to use the browser console can go in here, go into our HTML, and make any edits that they want to our HTML. 
Then you just edit that. So you can't, uh, this is something I'll stress quite a bit whenever we're talking about front end, you cannot trust your HTML from the front end. In fact, you can't trust your CSS or your JavaScript either. Anything on the front end cannot and should not be trusted. Anybody can just change these values at their leisure, or at their will. Now, they didn't break too much because once I click upvote, that variable is still storing the value that it had originally. All I did was change the HTML. But I can definitely break this by editing HTML. I could just delete this whole element if I want, and now I can't do anything. The whole site's broken. It's not too much of a concern because people can only break their downloaded copy of the site, but this is still something that we always have to be aware of when we're messing around with front end development. So, but they only mess with the HTML. Oh, I, I just showed that. They only mess with the HTML, so the next step will reverse that. The JavaScript is going to override the HTML in that case. But we can go to this next tab, this console tab, where we have access to the votes variable. So any JavaScript, any variables, or anything running on a website, you can just go to the console and mess with it. Votes equals a whole bunch. Now I didn't call, I could do this with the button. Let me do this more interesting way. I can call my own functions too right in the console. So the user is not restricted to the JavaScript that you write and package with that site. They are not restricted to that. They can write any JavaScript and execute any JavaScript that they want. It's all up to them. They literally downloaded your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and downloaded it onto their computers. They have control over that. They have access to it. It's on their hard drive, or, or at least in their RAM. They have access to all of that, and they can edit any of that. And the browser console just gives us a convenient way to be able to do that without having to really dig into things and, and find that code. It gives us direct access to it. So this is legitimately changing that variable. And the number of votes is, uh, is ridiculously different now. I, I think I want to skip the next one. I don't think it's going to work so well on this side. Uh, but I want to go to browser extensions. So you can run arbitrary JavaScript on a website, but say there is something that you want to change with the website. You want to run your JavaScript. You kind of want to inject your code into the sites that you visit. But you don't want to open up the console and type that code every single time. If you want JavaScript to run every time you load a page, this is where we use browser extensions. We're going to use an extension to be able to manipulate a page. Actually, I do want to do this with an extension. Uh, let, let, me, let me back up a second. Uh, and it, not back up, but uh, we want to run an extension to run JavaScript on this every single time, uh, every time we load the page. So we could do something like document dot get element by tag name. So if we look at my HTML, what I want to do, what I'm going to try to do here, what I'm going to successfully do here, is simulate clicks of this upvote button and simulate a lot of them. And then I want to write an extension that's going to do that every time this page loads. I want to simulate button clicks of this button. So I want to get this HTML element. And now I'm on the other side. I want to write an extension to kind of break this site and manipulate the site a little bit. And we're going to assume I don't have access to change the HTML. I'm not going to be able to change the HTML in this case. So I want to write an extension for this page, assuming somebody else wrote it, and I can't just say a uh, button. One thing I want to do right here, give this button an ID so I can easily find it. I'm not going to be able to, to, to do that. So, but I can get this by tag name. So I'm going to get the tag name button. This gives me a data structure with all of the elements with that tag name. So every button on this page is going to give it to me, and my next task is to figure out which one is the upvote button. Now I can, the autocomplete is kind of spoiling this there, but I want to do something more robust than that when we go to the extension. I can't just guess, 
I'm going to either get the first one or the second one. One of those two is going to be the upvote button. And then I want to simulate a click. The autocomplete's giving spoilers out there. Um, and then just give it a click. So if I run this JavaScript, it's going to simulate that click. And then I can keep running this. Just simulate a bunch of clicks. But I don't want to open up my console and do that every time. That's what we're going to talk about, web extensions. I was, I was thinking of skipping this one. I think I got to do the auto boot. It's too inter uh, It's uh, uh, something we're going to do. <laughs> All right. So this is what we call a web extension. First, any questions, by the way? I'm covering a, a good amount of topics here. I am leveraging that you're all, you know, you're, you're competent programmers at this point. I, I'm leveraging a lot of the, the fact that you're juniors in computer science. I believe I can go this fast. If that's not true, you know, if there are questions, let me know. Let's do it. Okay, so this, for this, we're going to build a JavaScript, a web extension. Web extensions have been standardized over time. Uh, Chrome kind of took over and everybody else started copying Chrome. So the setup for an extension is the same in any major browser. So we're gonna look at that setup. Uh, they, the internet likes to call them Chrome extensions still, but they'll work on other major browsers. I've been using Opera here. I'm gonna use Opera for this, but these will work just the same in Chrome or Firefox. So this is all pretty much boilerplate. This manifest.json file is going to be the file that your browser reads to figure out how your web extension is structured. And most of this, the manifest version, the current version is two. This is the version number of the manifest file, which is going to tell your browser how it's structured. Current standard is two, so this line, this key value pair is always going to be in your manifest. The name, whatever we want to name it, I'll call it, uh, Auto voter, I don't know. The version number, this is up to us. It's whatever version number of this, uh, of this software, of this release. I'll call it 0 0.1, we're not an official release or whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter for our purposes here, but when you have version control and you're updating and releasing new versions of your software, obviously you'd want to pay more attention to that. And then the content, what's going to happen? When is it ran? So first, the JavaScript file that we're going to run, this one right here, this is the file that's going to run when our extension is triggered. And then the matches say, when are we going to trigger this extension? When should this extension run? Specifically on what pages do you want this to run? So for our purposes, I'm not hosting our website out there at all. I'm just going to do matches star to match every single website so it's always going to run, even when it's not my auto voter site. Not something we want to do, but since I'm running this off of uh, as file, actually, did I do file star? Let me just do star to make sure it runs it. Uh, so it's always going to run. Now, when that loads, it's going to run this JavaScript code. It's going to run this JavaScript file and do whatever we want to do on this page that we don't own or that we don't control. But we can run our own JavaScript every time we load that page. So let's start with just a print statement. Let's go to our extensions, and you can look up how to install extensions for, for whatever browser you're interested in. For Opera, I'm going to click this Load Unpacked. Twelve examples, but not that three twelve examples. Oh no! I did it in PyCharm uh, and AutoBoat extension. So I'm going to go to this directory and just point my browser to that entire. Oh, and uh, tell it to that that directory is what contains my uh, 
my extension. Maybe I have to have. Maybe I have to have that. Apparently, I have to define a protocol. I did not know that. So now, when I go to any page, when I load this page, I have my extension code running on that site as soon as the page loads. So after, and the extension runs after everything for that page loads. So everything loads, and then my extension runs here. I'm just just a quick break statement. Um, but let's do something a little more interesting here. So what I really want to do is take that code that we had in the browser, uh, get elements by tag name. I'm going to get every button, the tone. I want to iterate over all of these. And I want to say if lm dot, I'll do inner text here, dot includes, uh, yeah, I don't want to do the exact, I don't remember the exact values off the top of my head. But, uh, but I'll do exact includes, oh, sorry, you mean dot value here? Do I need that? I might need that, you're right. Uh, and if it includes yes uh, two two lowercase I don't think I do need the value there uh, and I'll do two lowercase because I don't remember what my case was I have a few a uh, few things to make it more robust there uh, but if my element contains the word upvote in any capitalization, I want to run some code. And of course, what I want to do here is click the thing. I'm going to wrap this in a function. And we'll call this function. I'm going to go to my extensions, refresh my extension, go back to my page. It didn't call that function. I was trying to call includes on a function. That's not going to work for us. And we got a simulated click. Yay, go us. So we upvoted once. That's cool. But what we really want is a continuous auto voter. So what I'm going to do is a set interval, which is going to call a function every certain number of milliseconds. So I want to call this function. This is just one way we can keep clicking. I'm going to call upvote every 10 milliseconds. So I'm just going to mash that button with my code. And this is why I wrapped this in a function so I could do this pass set interval. This time I do want to pass it a function, not call the function. So I do mean to leave off my parentheses there. Refresh this extension. And we got an auto voter. So we can just keep mashing that button faster than humanly possible. Now we only uh, broke our own site here. Not super uh, helpful. Uh, but what if we broke a different site that we don't control? So let me first get rid of this extension since it's running on every single, uh, let's remove it completely. Since it's running on every single page, I don't want that. Um, and just in case I upload it again, let me make sure I have slower <laughs> auto voting there. Anyway, let's jump over to a different extension. Start watching some Netflix. Maybe I didn't leave enough time for this one. Let's try to, let's try to rush through at least part of this. If we don't get through it, I want to do this on Monday because it's more practical. Uh, and start watching some Netflix. And I hate that this is the one they're promoting today. When I, when I was testing it, it was Next in Fashion was the big one on top. 
Now it's I am a killer. I don't want to show this one in lecture, but whatever. Uh, so one change Netflix made a couple months, maybe a year ago by now, I don't know, Time, time's weird. Um, is they started having these big advertisements for one of their new shows right at the top of the page. And worst of all, in my opinion, it auto plays. So as soon as you load Netflix, <laughs> it, it did. It didn't do it immediately, though. Maybe I had to scroll over it. Oh, you know what? It's taken a while to load, it looks like. But it auto plays. Talk about this. You watch Netflix. Probably you know, maybe you don't feel the same way I do. Maybe you actually like this, but I think that's annoying. So, what we can do is go into the council. And I looked through this a, a bit for each page. If you want to do this stuff, you should. You need to look through the HTML, look through their code, and figure out what exactly you know how they do things, and then kind of reverse engineer a little bit. Uh, I'll forget. Uh, I should put my disclaimer on here. Probably violating some terms of services if you do this too much in, in the wrong places and stuff. So just a, a warning there. But I want to show how the website behave. Is my focus here. And if we go up here to this element and just delete it. Oops, I went too, I went a little too far there. We're definitely going to be finishing this on mon uh, Monday. Went a little too far. So if we delete that, it's just gone. Now that'd be a wonderful thing for an extension, wouldn't it? To be able to do that every time Netflix loads, just delete that element immediately. And yeah, we're running out of time. Uh, my, so we'll, we'll see how exactly to do that one on Monday. Uh, the one thing I want to close with is this is how, if you install an ad blocker extension, this is how ad blockers work. The page loads, ad blocker says, here's all this JavaScript. There's all the stuff we're going to block. We're going to look for all the stuff on your page and then block it. If block is something that you could write, you can look for those certain things and then delete those elements and get rid of them. With that, have a good weekend. I'll see you Monday.